was his work and his passion that honed his skill and gained him international acclaim. Rick Hansen can't recall the day he first imagined wheeling around the world. From the moment he began accepting life in a wheelchair, he had dreamed of the ultimate marathon. He'd been told it wasn't possible, but that had never stopped him before. I'm going to wheel around the world to raise awareness and funds for spinal cord research, rehabilitation and wheelchair sport. And I'm doing it because I want to help. The Rick Hansen who spoke those words in 1984 had no idea what lay ahead of him. The Man in Motion tour would last two years, two months, and two days, and would raise $26 million. Rick Hansen would wheel the circumference of the earth, 40,000 kilometers, and he would return home to Vancouver a hero. Today, Rick Hansen continues his life's work, motivating and encouraging others to be their best. And he always signs his name the same way. Rick Hansen is the oldest of four children. His natural leadership qualities enhanced by his position in the family. When Dad wasn't around, Rick was always there for us and would always be giving us guidance and um, advice. He was always the one that we would lean on. He seemed to uh, always be aware of, like he'd tell the girls, you know, don't you chum with them, they don't talk very nice. You know, he was very smart. He, he always knew if we were bad. <laughs> he found out, you know, he found out. He would trick us into telling him if we were bad. He would say stuff like, you know, geez, you know, Christine, I heard that what you did today. And then I would confess everywhere, I'd be on the floor crying, you know. And he'd start laughing, he goes, geez, you're easy to get, you know. He was, he was difficult at times. He, he was a pretty headstrong boy when he was younger, different than the rest. And as all of them have their own personalities when they grow up, you would give him a spanking and uh, he wouldn't cry. That's stubbornness right there. The Hanson family was constantly on the move from one small British Columbia town to another. In 1971, they settled in Williams Lake, a small mill town in the B.C. interior. Throughout his childhood, Rick excelled at every kind of sport, from baseball and volleyball to badminton, tennis and basketball. And when he wasn't playing sports, he was outdoors, hunting or fishing. His grandpa Joe and I took him out at three years old, fishing at a small lake, Put him on a log. It took him about four casts, and he knew how to cast the fish line out there. Before Rick became a teenager, his parents' marriage began to deteriorate. They would eventually divorce, and to escape the turmoil, Rick spent more and more time away from home. One day, at the age of 15, he decided to go fishing in Bella Coola with his friends Don and Randy. We were out there fishing and had a great time, and caught a bunch of fish, and... It was a wonderful sort of, you know, summer adventure for all of us. Don and Rick decided to hitchhike home from their fishing trip. You don't get many vehicles that come along this road. And uh, sure enough, uh, one vehicle then passes, and another one comes along and Rick's up waving his hands, and Don, wake up, get up. So he gave us a ride, but um, the conditions were that he, of course, uh, was in the cab with his girlfriend, and we had to sit in the back of the truck. Not a problem, except for that the back of his box at the truck was full up with equipment that he was moving, toolboxes, suitcases, etc. So we were sitting level with the tailgate. And I had been having a little snooze, and Don was hanging on to the fish. Next thing you know, I hear the girlfriend screaming, and just getting down the road, and the truck goes to my side and flips over. Unfortunately, I was thrown back first against the ground and there was a big steel toolbox that fell first and it snapped me against the corner of it and, and broke my back. I was just laying there, I mean, you know, uh, in pain uh, and agony and 
and my legs are numb and uh, you know and I poke them and they turn to jelly and um, I, I mean I was just completely you know out of it I mean uh, devastated uh, and 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 with that sinking feeling you know that 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 I'm in serious serious trouble it was just instant tears it was it was just awful and I we went to the hospital from there and then um, <clears throat> changed our lives forever. <laughs> they came out and told us it was permanent and they took him to Vancouver by ambulance. I remember going in to see him and um, there he was lying face down. And we'd have to sometimes go under the bed to talk to him. We'd be lying on the floor. Hi Rick, how's it going? It would be pretty difficult to look at a floor and look at a ceiling and have nothing to do but think and think and think. And I think that's the times where his dark hours were and I can sure feel for him because uh, what he had taken away, everything going and all of a sudden, nothing. And I developed a fever and a splitting headache and started to feel nauseous and, and I was on the down flip at the time, so face down. And it was like three in the morning and I guess the, the, there was staff change or something going on. So, um, I, you know, I just chucked everywhere and, uh, and I'm sitting there pushing the button and nobody's coming and, you know, and I'm, uh, I'm sitting there sort of looking down at this puddle of puke and, and, and I can't do anything about it. I'm, uh, I'm like trapped. I guess at that point, uh, somehow I managed to draw on some of the things that I'd learned in sport, you know, about uh, setting goals. and. There's some certain things that I wasn't able to control or you know or deal with right then, and that was the emotional reality of maybe not being able to use my legs again. But there were some things I could do, and and uh, and I I kept pushing the edge of the envelope. You know, when could I get out of that striker bed? You know, when could I get that tube out of my out of my nose? And you know, uh, when could I start working on my arms? You know, you're just the same. You want to go back and do the same things that you did before. So when people tell you, no, it's not possible, then somebody like Rick is going to challenge the system and say, okay, well, I'm going to do it. it. may not be the way I did it before, but it's going to be pretty close. I remember Mom and Dad having to change the house before he came home, and it was a big priority, Dad putting the railings up, um... Uh, changing the bathroom for Rick. Then he, he was home and he was on crutches. A person in a wheelchair was not going to be very functional, especially, you know, when I looked at my home and I had, you know, like eight stairs up, ten stairs down, uh, stairs at the back, stairs at the front, everywhere. Um, stairs in my school, stairs in the local theater. So to me, even though I was being kind of discouraged from trying to walk on crutches and braces, the rehab center, that was my ticket to go home. And I worked my butt off uh, trying to learn how to, how to walk on the crutches and braces. And that was one thing. And the other thing is once I could do that, uh, I, I felt that when I was standing up, I, was, I, I perceived myself and felt that others perceived me as being less disabled. In 1973, the normal rehabilitation period for a paraplegic was six months. Rick returned home in half that time to a troubled household and found his greatest support elsewhere. A guy named Bob Redford was a tremendous inspiration to me. Uh, he was my volleyball coach and phys ed teacher before my accident. And he knew that I was born an athlete and he knew that sport was really important to me. That's almost the first place he came to was the gym, the place that uh, before his accident had meant so much to him and probably meant a lot to him after it too, but uh, he was scared. And so when I came back to that first day in school and went back into the gymnasium and I sort of peered around the corner and saw my old buds you know, realizing I couldn't ever be with them again, my first instinct was to run out of that gym and just never come back. Actually, I remember the day he came back from back to school, and uh, everyone was really awkward and didn't know what to say to him. And um, and he started helping out with our volleyball team, and that's when I really got to know him. He had some great friends like Patty Luke and Kerry Hutchison, and they all played sports. Don Alder, 
uh, and they stuck with him the whole time and uh, really provided him, I think, a support group that he needed. For a paraplegic, crutches and braces are a difficult way to get around. Rick fell often, but he never let anyone help him get up. We did everything together. We'd go out to Falker Lake and, you know, for picnics and drinking parties and uh, also out to Blue Lake. We all knew him so well that it was, we just, oh well, Rick's in one of his moods and off he'd go. The local swimming hole was down a hill and, you know, because I was comparing things to the way they were before, I would want to be with them and, and yet I was too sort of self-conscious to sort of let myself be carried down the, the, the hill because it was sort of a, uh, a pride ego sort of thing and, and that wasn't the way I used to do it. And, and yet being with them was important and so I would sit up in the, in the truck while they were down there having a swim or I wouldn't go. About grade 12 Rick and I spent a lot of time after school just talking about what he was going to do with his life after he left school. I kept saying to him, what, do you, what did you want to do before you were, became handicapped? And he said, I want to be a PE teacher. And I says, well, be a PE teacher. Well, he says, I can't, I'm in a wheelchair. And he kept saying, Rick, you know, he says, you've just been working with me as an assistant coach and as a trainer, and you've been doing a great job. You've been coaching grade sevens all by yourself, and, like, why can't you do that? So I guess he accepted, yeah, he would try it. And, of course, he applied to get into PE at UBC. Told him I was in a wheelchair and uh, wanted to be in phys ed and got a letter back saying, Dear Mr. Hansen, thanks for your application. Uh, we recommend that you come down in first year arts and sciences and we'll uh, talk about whether or not you can enter into phys ed in second year. In second year at the University of British Columbia, Rick entered the phys ed faculty, the first disabled person to ever do so. There he met Stan Strong, a paraplegic and a pioneer in wheelchair sport, who urged Rick to join his wheelchair basketball team, the Vancouver Cable Cars. Rick got involved in wheelchair table tennis and volleyball, but the toughest competition was in wheelchair track and marathoning and Rick Hansen decided to specialize. He was a fierce competitor. Rick Hansen went on to win this marathon in Toronto, and he kept on winning. The Pan Am Games in 82, uh, he won nine gold medals from distances ranging from 100 meters on up. You know, he won three uh, world championships in the marathon. Um, was the first athlete to break the two-hour barrier in the marathon. That period of time was sort of one of those zenith periods in your life where you think, God, everything was just clicking. There's been a number of points throughout my life where, where it is, but that point everything was clicking because, you know, I was back doing what I loved doing. In 1983, Rick Hansen shared the Lou Marsh Award with Wayne Gretzky as Canada's top male athlete. But someone he'd recently met would be the catalyst for an even greater achievement. Somebody told me about this young man who played uh, JV basketball for Simon Fraser University and his name was Terry Fox and he just lost his leg to cancer and so I called him up that night and said, uh, come on out. And he did and that was the, the beginning of it. <laughs> He was a pretty exceptional, passionate kid right from the moment he jumped into the gymnasium. Although Terry's Marathon of Hope was undertaken to raise money for cancer, to Rick, it proved the potential of a disabled person. This would become the focus of his world tour. The tour needed sponsors. The first place Rick went was Expo 86, whose theme was Man in Motion. Patrick Reed, his future father-in-law, remembers that day. He came into my office in, at Expo 86 in 1984 uh, with two or three henchmen, uh, and the proposition was, 